Okay, well, I think we'll um, we'll kick off with the webinar. With the webinar, Kia ora. Um, welcome to our Northern Wasp webinar as part of Be Aware Month. I'm John Hampson, the uh, New Zealand Anchor Trust's Northern Coordinator, and also a hobby beekeeper. We're we're really into the spring build-up for our bee colonies ahead of the nectar flow, which will start in the next couple of weeks. But it's also the spring build-up for wasps. Introduced social wasps are hugely damaging to our apiculture industry, to our native biodiversity, and they also disrupt our daily lives to some extent. And while we are concerned about the problems posed by introduced social wasps, there are many other fascinating wasp species here in Aotearoa. I'm not a wasp ex expert, but I want to show with you what I've learned, share with you what I've learned while compiling this webinar. Please use the um, the chat function to um, ask questions. Um, otherwise, um, I hope you enjoy the webinar. Okay, so first up, um, wasps are part of an order of insects um, called Hymenoptera. It's one of the largest insects, insect groups and it um, contains a number of solitary and social species. It includes, um, as well as the wasp, includes bees and ants. Insects in this order have um, four stages to their life cycle. The female adult lays an egg. That egg hatches into a larva which uh, eats and grows. It then pupates. And from um, and then that pupa eventually emerges as an adult, and so that cycle continues. Not all of the species in this in the order Hymatop in the order Hymnoptera can uh, fly, but of those that can, they have two sets of wings, and the front and the back wings lock together during flight. During flight, that's sort of unique to that species, or the, that order. Um, and it's only the females that can sting. So of the 4,000 species of social wasps worldwide, we have five species of social wasp that have been introduced to Aotearoa New Zealand. First up was the Australian wasp, which um, was introduced uh, oh, back in the 1800s. That was followed by the German wasp, Vespula germanica, around about the 1940s. Then in the 1970s, we had the Asian paper wasp arrive. And around about the same time, we had uh, the common wasp, Vespula vulgaris, but, but that really started to become dominant in the 1980s. The name Vespula vulgaris is a Latin name, and the vulgaris doesn't mean vulgar, it actually refers to the word common. Um, and the, la the last of the social wasps to be introduced was um, the European paper wasp, which was first discovered in the late 2000s, early 2010s. So all, all of these five wasps have painful stings, and in some cases they can um, create anaphylact anaphylactic shock in humans, so it's, it's, you know, it's not great, um, but the paper wasps do tend to be less aggressive. When I say introduced, they were all introduced by accident. They were, none of these five species were intentionally introduced. Okay, to take a closer look at um, these five species, <coughs> First up, this is the Asian paper wasp. Um, all these pictures I'm going to show you of wasps were taken in Northern. So this this lady here on the left, this was this photo. She was snapped back in the Poto Peninsula in January 2020, and this small this nest here was observed in Kaiwaka in 2018. And um, and these paper wasps were building their nest on a young porter tree. So all paper wasps are voracious predators of small insects particularly the caterpillars of uh, moths and butterflies. But they also, can, they also compete with other insects for nectar and, and honeydew. The Asian paper wasp frequently construct, construct its nest above ground. Um, I've got a little um, example to show you here. It is, it is made of paper and the wasps like to um, uh, consume and devour wood, which they then regurgitate to make these fine paper, paper nests. Um, like I said, they're above ground, usually on houses, on, um, on fencing, around buildings, but also in um, trees and bushes. Large populations often occur in lowland habitats, particularly in shrublands, swamps and salt marshes. The Asian paper wasp is larger than the Australian paper wasp, um, and it's found throughout North and, and much of the Upper North Island. <clears throat> 
and, and it can occur at really high densities. You can get more than 200 nests per hectare, which equates to around 6,300 wasps per hectare. So um, the impact of, of these um, high densities of wasps is pretty concerning in terms of their effect on our native, native ecosystems. But um, it, it's not really an area that's been well researched to, to really quantify that effect. Um, they're certainly thought to be one of the reasons why we see a lot less of um, the monarch butterfly because the, these wasps are predating on, on, the, on the caterpillars of the monarch butterflies. Okay, next up we have um, the Australian paper wasp. It's um, smaller than the Asian paper wasp. This, this picture here on the left is, um, was taken back in um, March 2019 and in uh, or Fananaki and the one on the right at Matapori in 2023. Here you can see the uh, nest has been built on the underside of a, of a flax frond. Unlike the Asian paper wasps, they don't tend to nest on, on buildings and, and human structures. They're, they're more reclusive. They, 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 they prefer to nest, as from what I can tell, on, on vegetation, be it native or exotic. But again, voracious predators, particularly of, of, of caterpillars. The next species of paper wasp is the European paper wasp. I mentioned earlier that this was first discovered in, in the early 2000s, in the, and that was in the top of the South Island around the Nelson area. Um, like its nests tend to be about twice the size of the Asian paper wasp, and it also likes to build its nest in close to proximity to humans. So it does like to build nests in the eaves and in ceiling cavities. So in that sense, it's more likely to be a pest in the, in the way it comes into contact with us as human beings. Also, some evidence I read for the Nelson area suggests that it's becoming much more dominant the, than the Asian paper wasp. Now, you, this picture here um, of this map I took from a website called iNaturalist, which is a citizen science map but it's a, that allows members of the public to find it, uh, that have discovered an insect, they're not sure what it is, they can post it on the website and there's a community of knowledge of people that will help them out to identify it. This map shows where the European paper wasp has been identified around New Zealand. You can see that um, from its um, landing point in the top of the South Island, you can see there's a real, um, real cluster of sightings. It's made its way down the South Island but it's not really getting much of a foothold in the North Island yet. You can see there's a couple of dots around Wellington and um, sort of south of Napier. But other than that, the main observations are in Auckland. Um, the latest observation was in, around Silverdale, Fonga Paroa in May 2022 on this website, with the first sightings in Auckland in 2016. So it probably came into the port and it started to become established, but it's not yet made its way into Northland. So, you know, this is what it looks like. If you see it and you can deal to it safely, I, I'd highly recommend dealing to it because it's not, it's not well established as a population here. So that leads us on to um, perhaps the, uh, the biggest culprits of all in terms of um, the, invas the invasive wasps or, or the social wasps, and that's the common wasp on which you can see in the picture on the left-hand side. This was one picture this one was taken in Russell, and the one on the right is um, Vespula germanica, the German wasp that was taken in the South Pokianga in 2022. It's very hard to tell them apart, um, but what you can actually see from these pictures, you can see on the common wasp how the dots on the back are actually fused in the around the middle to the to the to the black band, whereas they're much more distinct on the uh, German wasp. It's actually much easier to tell them apart facially. Common wasp again on the left and the German wasp on the right. And you can see the, the German wasp, um, the facial masking, markings are different. You can see it's much more yellow. And these three dots you can see just below, these are the mandibles, the jaws here for chewing things up. The, these dots here are a bit of a giveaway. You can see it's a much darker face on the common wasp. But to all intents and purposes, they're, they're very similar in terms of, terms of their biology and their habits. So why are wasps having such an impact on our ecosystem? 
Well, along with their biology, particularly their reproductive cap capacity, Aotearoa offers this beautiful, suitable climate for them with an abundance of food and really no significant natural predators. So this, this allows them to develop large colonies which they can support through flexible predation. So wasps eat a range of invertebrates, including spiders, caterpillars, ants, bees and flies, and they chop them up and they carry them back to their nest to feed to their brood. But, you know, um, these insects that they're, they're taking from the, the food chain, that's the protein source that they need to build their brood. Um, but they're also scavengers, they'll feed on carrion, they'll even feed on pet food, and it's also been suggested that they may prey on, on nesting birds. So adult wasps aren't eating the prey that they kill. In fact, all adult wasps, and I mean the worker wasps, they don't, they don't live very long, so they don't really need that protein source. They just need to load up on carbohydrates in the form of sugar. And in the wild, they get that, those sugars from, from flower nectar and from honeydew, which is um, you know, often produced by our native scale insects. So it's the protein that's really feeding the brood so in the, much the same way that bees um, take protein from plant pollen, and to build their brood, wasps aren't interested in plant pollen. They like their protein from, from living things or, or, de or dead things, but it's um, a biological protein. Now, a lot of the research um, on, on the common German wasps is focused around the beech forests at the top of the South Island and the relationship between the wasp and the honeydew that's produced by the native scale insect that lives on, on, those, um, on those beech trees. But there is research um, that's been done in, um, further north for the North Island. And, in, and back in 2012, the University of Auckland showed that wasps were the most common visitors to the honeydew of Carnuka trees in northern New Zealand and suggested that their abundance um, and predation uh, and use of that honeydew may be disrupting the associations between native birds and that the honeydew present on, the, on, on, on those Carnuka um, bushes. There's also earlier research from semi-urban scrub and pasture habitats around, around the Hamilton area, which found that wasps were responsible for, for around 12,000 to 75,000 prey predations per hectare per, se per season. So they're massively taking out um, the, the bottom of the food chain, the protein that those other higher order native insects, particularly our honey eaters like, like, like other birds, and, and the insects are, rely, um, are relying upon. So they're, they're, they're distorting the food web. <coughs> so I talked a little about lifespans. As I said, the social, uh, the worker wasps, <coughs> which are the sterile females, they have an average lifespan of 12 to 22 days. The drones, which are the um, fertile females, have a slightly longer lifespan than workers. And um, the, um, the queens, which are the fertile females, have an average lifespan of, of 12 months. Sorry, I was just pausing there a second. Um, so this wheel you can see here, you can see it's got the months of the year um, down the bottom. You can see September, October. So we're, we're in September, October now. And you can see, um, this is just coming back to their biology, you can see how the queens have Pretty much by now emerged and for many of you you've, you've probably seen um wasps floating around be they the paper wasps or, or, or the common and the germans they probably by now initiated their nests and the queen uh, uh, the queens are rearing their young what, what actually happens is the queen actually rears those young she goes out and forages for food and, and feeds that brood and, and raises that brood but eventually she'll become nest bound and as the workers emerge they'll take on the task of, of raising the brood and foraging for food and the queen purely focuses on, on laying eggs. And then really from, I guess, late October through November, right through April, you see this nest expansion until you get to that peak nest activity, which typically occurs around February, March time. And that's when um, the, the the colony is producing males and, and females, and those females are, go are eventually going to leave the nest. They're going to uh, mate with males, probably from other colonies too, um, and those females will become the new queens um, for the following season. So that period of, intense of intensity when you see um, 
you know, the air is, can be thick with wasps sometimes. And that's probably as really in some ways the wasp is in its death throes because it, it, the queen's no longer laying and you're in that final phase of, of the last cohort of wasps, which really probably have not much purpose now because they're not raising, raising brood and they're just living out their lives. And a similar biology to the paper wasps, although they, you know, they don't reach the same um, populations towards the end of the season. And this picture I'm showing on the left hand side, I took this just on Tuesday, actually. This was a paper wasp that was um, building its nest on, on my garden fence. And I took a picture of it, and as I looked closer, I could actually see that she'd laid her eggs just in the center of those cells. Um, I did actually uh, squish this nest after, so those, those aren't ever going to hatch. But you can see that coming back to that um, diagram, she's probably fit, following a similar cycle in terms of um, brood rearing and buildup. NPI back in 2015 did a little bit of research into the economic analysis of, of the effect wasps were having on our economy. They discovered or, or they worked out really that wasps are costing us around 60 million a year to partial farming through um, the disruption to bee pollination activities, which reduces the amount of clover in pastures and increases fertilizer costs. There's a nine million dollar cost of beekeepers from wasps attacking honeybees and robbing their honey, destroying the hives. Wasp related traffic accidents cost 1.4 million a year. One million a year is spent on the health costs from wasps things. And on top of these direct costs, we've got an almost 60 million a year loss, loss in unrealized honey production from those South Island beech forests um, because they're currently monopolized by, moth, uh, by wasps. So the report concluded that um, the effect of wasps from now through to 2020 is somewhere, the, the cost is somewhere from 70 million through to two billion dollars. $2 and if they had to put a point in it, they went, they went for a figure of 1,350 million. So there's a very real economic case for finding a cost a cost effective solution for, for controlling wasps. Um, now, if you have a quick look on the internet, you'll find um, no shortage of examples of, of um, young men going a bit gung-ho gung with uh, matches and um, aerosol canisters. And uh, just quick examples here. So some examples there of some quite low tech, oh, let's just pause that video. Um, some examples of some quite low tech and some quite high tech solutions to dealing with um, specific wasp problems. Obviously those are for wasps that have chosen to ne nest in trees. Uh, the German and wasps do tend to nest underground, but we do get some large wasp nests that you do find above ground. Um, but I suggest that with the fire, the, the fire bands and the, um, that we have here in New Zealand, those probably aren't going to be and the, be the best solutions. Um, pouring petrol into nests is, is also um, quite a popular way. And it, it is very effective, but again, it does come with being a fire hazard. Um, and the wasps can react quite violently to the fumes, which can be a real problem if you've got a, an underground wasp nest with more than one entrance and you hadn't realized there was more than one entrance. You might end up with um, the some very aggressive wasps pouring out. So be very cautious of pouring, a pe pouring petrol is, is your preferred method. So outside of those more gung-ho appro gung approaches, what, what other options were available to us? Well, we've got the physical and, and chemical controls. If you're a beekeeper, um, I guess the first control really um, 
it's really about maintaining healthy colonies. It's about how it's about good bo varroa control and good um, disease control to make sure that you've got a, a strong, healthy colony that goes through the honey flow and finishes the season as strong as possible so it can defend itself against wasps. That might include um, juicing um, your entrance ways to make them more defendable. And also using things like wasp traps. Um, wasp traps, um, they're quite good for reducing um, the population that's around you. This, this is a technique that will never um, obviously kill off a nest, but it is a way to capture and reduce the, the population in that nest by, simply by just by trapping and drowning them. And you can see on the left hand side here an example of a, a homemade wasp trap. It's just a, a, a bottle with the top cut off and turned upside down so the wasps can fly in but they can't fly out. You can also go down to your hardware store and, 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 and buy um, perhaps a, a more robust version of this. The key to success really is the solution that you've got in the bottom. And this is a little bit, bit like uh, George's Marvelous Medicine. You, you really need, you've really got to have your mixes right, but you're looking for something that's um, sweet and sugary, but is slightly sour so that it's attracted to the, bot, the wasps, but it's not attracted to the bees. And depending on the time of the season, so you might also add um, some protein to it. So maybe some pet food or some, some tinned fish um, to make it highly palatable to the wasps. Now, um, pesticides, <clears throat> there's, there's a number of um, commercial products out there that you can go down to your hardware store and buy, and they're all, <clears throat> they're all very effective for localised problems at home and more generally. Particularly for um, paper wasps, fly, um, particular brands of fly spray, just aerosol fly sprays can be very effective and, and obviously very quick and safe, safe to use. But that would be the key message really is to make sure that you um, you use them safely. I'm just going to come back to hive, the hive gate, which I mentioned there, and I'll come back to pesticides. So the hive, the hive gate is, um, is a new product that's been designed here in New Zealand for beekeepers as a, as a form of uh, wasp defense. And what it is, it's a little plastic insert that you put in the bottom of your beehive. So again, you close down your entranceway you install the hive gate and what it does is it just gives one smaller point of entry but it forces both the entering bees and the wasps to travel down the to travel down the gate and the way the gate's positioned is it actually means that those bees and those wasps are, are emerging in the hive around um, the main cluster of bees so that any intruder is is more quickly and rapidly identified and dealt with. So it's sort of a it's improving the natural defense mechanism of the bees by targeting intruders into the main cluster. OK, coming back to pesticides or insecticides, probably um, Vespex is probably our, real, our most top level um, product that we've got in New Zealand at the moment. It was developed um, by a company called Machento in, um, in association with the Department of Conservation. It's been on the market now for six or seven years. It's all based around the wasps requiring protein to feed their growing, lar their growing larvae, as I mentioned previously, and that wasps will scavenge for good quality protein sources to take back to the nest. So Vespex really uses that behavior through a formulation that's, that's really very attractive and, uh, and palatable to wasps. Um, and the insecticide itself, which is uh, the active ingredient is flipronil, is very, um, it's quite slow acting, um, but in terms of the effect, it does work quite quickly, if that makes sense. So the wasps gather the bait, they take it back to the nest, where it's shared throughout the colony, including to the queen. And you only need relatively small quantities to destroy a whole nest. But timing is essential, and an effective baiting campaign is really dependent on knowing when your wasp population in your area as a high demand for protein. And Vespex have produced a simple testing procedure to allow you to work that out. But typically the threshold level for protein foraging, it's, it's rarely reached before mid-January and, and often into early February. But you're aiming to bait those wasps before their interest in protein wanes, you know, typically around um, April or mid-April. So to purchase Vespex, I, I mentioned its active ingredients is Fipronil. 
that's actually um, a regulated chemical. You can't just go out and buy buckets of fipronil. You can only buy it as a component of a product, in this case, Vespex. So to purchase Vespex, you need to be what's called an approved user. So you need to take an approved user test that's done via, the, via Machenta using their website. Um, so you complete the test and then you complete a registration form and pay a registration fee, which is currently selling at about 58 bucks. And then you're free to um, purchase Vespex. Sounds a little bit bureaucratic, but it is for good reason. Fipronil is, is highly toxic to bees and a whole host of other um, insects if it's not used appropriately. You can see here that um, their recommendations for um, deploying Vespex, so you can do it uh, in grid systems, but it really is getting into those bigger air, bigger land areas of control. They're even suggesting in, ex in excess of 200 hectares. Okay, so outside of chemical and physical control, controls, our next, our next suite of options are biocontrols. And really, this is, this is not new science and new technology. Since ancient times, people have used biocontrols. Chinese growers um, back in ancient times placed the nests of predatory ants into lemon trees to control leaf feeding insects. Um, but in classical biocontrol, it's really about taking um, a natural enemy from the country of origin of that pest um, and then um, going through what's called um, a host testing process to make sure that when you bring it into your bring that um, organism into the new range it, it itself is not going to become a pest or predate on insects that you didn't want it to predate upon it, you know, it will only focus on your pest species um it's highly regulated in New Zealand. There is a piece of legislation called the Hazardous Substances and New Organisms Act, which means that you should you have to go through a legal appro approval process, which typically costs many years, takes many years and, and costs quite a bit of cash to put in place. So um, in a natural range, wasps have a number of a number of predators. It includes, um, includes um, several species of birds, um, and mammals, for example, in Britain, um, badgers are a chief predator of wasp nests. They'll actually dig up an entire colony. They'll destroy an, an entire colony to get to that, that brood. This picture on the left here, this is actually a European hornet predating on a common wasp. And there are also several species of dragonflies, robberflies, but hornets, and centipedes and spiders. But in, in New Zealand, you know, when the reason wasps have established their well is that those predators are, are just not really present. So in 1986, um, there was a, a species of parasitoid wasp was discovered in, in some of the hives around, I think, the South Island. So the, some of the scientists at, um, I forget which um, institution they were at, but they did a little bit more work into this insect. Um, it has a name, it's called um, Schwiegoschwege. And they found that, it, like I say, it was um, parasitizing the larva of wasps. And through, through the period from 1986 through 1989, there was a, um, around 100,000 cocoons containing this um, live pupa of Schwiegoschwege was distributed across the North Island and South Island in the hope that it would establish itself and parasitize um, the uh, wasp colonies in the hope that it would reduce the vigor of those wasp colonies. And that's an important point about biocontrols. They feed exclusively on the on the pest they're there to target, but they will they will probably never entirely wipe out that pest species. But they they um, reduce its intensity and its effect. Unfortunately, with Schwiegoschwege, by two thousand seven, the, the researchers have concluded that it it hadn't really had much of an effect and is unlikely to have much of an effect in the future. So this um, just left. Well, things went quiet for a wee while, to be honest. Um, and then the pace picked up again uh, in the early 2010s with some new research into some new biocontrols. This work was largely led by um, the Crown Research Institute, Monarchy Fenua, and they have discovered um, two species of insects. On the left, we have a hoverfly, with the, uh, it has the scientific name Volucella inansis, and on the right, we have um, Metoecus paradoxus, which um, has the, 
theme of um traditional name of the wasp um what was it the um the wasp nest eagle so a bit of a clue in the name there but um back in their host back in their native range which is southern england which is where um the german and common wasps in new zealand originated from these two species once they become once they start to parasitize a the nest they actually decimate the population and interestingly when the re the kiwi researchers were back in new zealand doing this research they they actually discovered that the schwickosvega that i mentioned earlier was not actually a very common parasite of um, wasps which is why it didn't work very well as a biocontrol here in new zealand but they're fairly con they're fairly convinced that these two um, heavily predate wasp nests. They found them in sort of 50 to 80% of the wasps nests that they um, looked into in England. This work has been funded by Tasman District Council, so they'll get first dibs on the rearing program. So we'll see these two species um, distributed probably across the top of the South Island before we see them establishing in other parts of the country. But um, the hoverfly is apparently a very good flyer, so it will distribute quickly. It, it may need a bit of a hand to hop across the Tasman, and it may be that people will actually collect um, the pupa of, the, of these um, insects and, and take them to the North Island. Now, um, unfortunately, these species were due to be released in um, 2012, but the um, researchers hit a bit of a problem. And the problem is that, that when they, they collected the larva of these two insects from England, they then need to bring them back to New, New Zealand and rear them. The problem is you're taking them from one season and bringing them into a totally different season. So you, it's called a diapause, and it's where a, a insect usually goes to a hibernation period. So you need to trick them out of that hibernation period. And it's a very tricky thing to do going between going between hemispheres and last year it actually failed so they didn't so the researchers didn't actually manage to release these two species last year i have contacted them to find out when the next um what what when their next date would be to try and rear and release i'm, I'm hoping it's this year but i haven't had um confirmation of that yet so these two um biocontrols will focus exclusively on um common and German wasps. They, they like to parasitize both. They, they won't do anything for the um, paper wasps. But Monarchy Fennel have done a little bit of research into that area too. And in 2021, they did a literature review of potential or promising biocontrols for paper wasps. And they have, just from this desk-based exercise, they have identified two species of moth and two, spe two species of parasitoid wasps that may well be of some use. Obviously, there's a whole um, testing phase that would need to go behind that su to support that and then a regulatory process. OK, so the development around those biocontrols is very exciting, but it's not been realised yet. Uh, and until then, we we may rely on pesticides like Vespex for local and broad scale control. One of the challenges for chemical control is that the way we use it, which is um, to deploy it over large areas and over consecutive years, means we're running the risk of actually getting resistance in our target species. And we, there are reports of fitprinol resistance occurring in other parts of the world in other pest insects. So we can't rely on best specs forever. Hopefully the biocontrol will work, but what else is there? Well, one, one of those things is, is genetic control. This is something that's still very much um, in the realms of theory and, and research at the moment. It's, it's not actually being done, and there's good reasons for that. Um, all, living, um, all living material is determined um, by its genetic material or its DNA. And um, gene editing is a, is a relatively recent technology that gives scientists the ability to change an organism's, organism's DNA. So it means you can add or remove or alter at particular locations in the genome of, of um, an organism. And the genome is the entire set of DNA instructions that, that are found in the cell of an organism. So um, back in 2019, the Royal Society published a paper um, around something called gene drives. And they, they put forward a number of scenarios, one for wasps, one for possums, and one for stoats. 
and a gene a gene drive is where in a laboratory setting you you t um for a particular organism you you turn off particular parts of that gene so you you could tend you could effectively create uh, an an infertility gene for wasp that you then release through the wasp population however just because we've got the technology to do this doesn't mean that we will or should do it there, there's scientific legal and um, ethical considerations to consider um, from a scientific standpoint our ability to edit genes is in some ways way ahead of our of our understanding of of everything that um, different genes do so by editing genes we may end up with unintended consequences um, from a legal position um, you couldn't just go ahead and do this even if you wanted to. You would, you would actually need um, approval to um, genetically edit or modify an organism and then release it into New Zealand. Again, this is covered through the Hazards of Substances and New Organisms Act. But probably ahead of both of those two things, to some degree, is the ethical, ethical perspectives. What if a gene-edited wasp was to make its way back to its natural range in Europe and we had unintentionally um, introduced sterility across um, European wasps? They, they're a valid and important component of the ecosystem there. So it does open up important questions uh, about our place in the wider world with regards to concepts like monarchy tanga, what's our cultural and social responsibility and, and what's ticker, what's right to do? But while society does sort of ponder and de debate these questions, there's still a lot of research that's happening and taking place in, in, in academia. And an ama a major development was in 2020, um, where a consortium of New Zealand um, research organisations managed to sequence the genome for both the common wasp and the German wasp. So if we do want to introduce um, sterility across the population of New Zealand, New Zealand wasps, We've got, we've effectively got the roadmap to now do that. Okay, I'm just going to um, draw, I'm going to move away from our more problematic wasps um, to, in this case, the, the yellow flower wasp, which is also um, a recent introduction. This um, this was uh, this is native to Australia and was first discovered in Topaki in the far north in in um, in two thousand. It's now found throughout Northland and it, and it's slowly moving southwards down the co coast of the North Island. This this lady here was pictured at Partawa North um, back in twenty twenty one. It's a solitary wasp. It's a, and again it's a parasitic wasp. As an adult, it does feed on, on, on nectar, and it's been observed foraging on manuka, on five finger, on pahutakawa, and a range of exotic species. Um, and it does have a sting, but it's not known to be aggressive towards humans. I'm sure if you sat on it or really did um, threaten it, then it may well sting you. But the problem with this wasp is that it is a parasite, and it actually parasitizes one of our native beetles, the sand scarab beetle, which is actually threatened here in the north, and it's, you know, it's, it's an endangered, I suppose it's becoming, close to becoming um, an endangered species. And the, the, um, the female wasp um, actually parasitizes the larva of the scarab beetle. It, 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 it stings it, paralyzes it, and then lays eggs on it. And then as the, wa as the wasp's eggs grow, the larva, um, and turn into larva, they slowly consume the, paras uh, the paralyzed um, beetle larva. It's also not fussy about beetles. I think there are other um, beetles, be they native or exotic, that it will parasitize. Turning to some of our, um, our native wasps, um, we have Narawiri, as they're called in Tereo, the hunting wasps. There's around um, 30 species of these wasps in New Zealand, and they're all solitary. The picture on the left is um, the large black hunting wasp. This picture was taken um, in Mangafile in 2021. It likes to nest in tunnels, in, in small little tunnels, in, in clay banks, particularly with a sunny aspect and, and often within forest settings. The female hunts um, tunnel web and trap of spiders and she, dragged those, she drags those back to her nest to feed to her, to her brood. 
as an adult, she feeds on white ripe fruit and the nectar of, of flowers such as Monica. Apparently it has a sting which is very painful but only lasts for a couple of seconds. This lovely picture here down below um, is of a mason wasp. It was taken in um, Cayo in December 2022. Again, it's a native species. It makes its nest out of mud and um, you'll often see it around your own home. It, like, it makes these little muddy nests in keyholes, in small crevices of buildings, but particularly in the folds of clothes and curtains. I don't know if you've ever seen them behind your curtains. She um, stings all web spiders, which paralyzes them, and then she flies them back to her nest as food for her larvae. But again, as an adult wasp, she only feeds on nectar. It doesn't usually sting people, and apparently it's not usually painful. This is my penultimate slide. Um, and this is um, a branch of wasps called the Ichneumonid wasps. These, again, are solitary parasitic wasps, and there's more than 300 species uh, in New Zealand. Many of them are native, and only about 80 of them even have a, a, a name from, from, a, from a human perspective. And the modern name for them is Naro Fiore, which means tail fly. They don't sting. Um, I, I think they can, some may do have a sort of a sting, but what they actually have at the back is this, what's called an ovipositor. So it's uh, this, this um, needle-like appendage, which they use when they parasitize, they'll, they'll um, jab that into the air or larva of, or pupa of, of another insect to lay the eggs on or, or in that, that host. So here's two examples here. This picture here, the one that's been captured inside the glass jar, this is called the army worm parasite. It's not much of a name, really. Its Latin name is Ichneumon promissorius. It likes to um, dig into the top, into topsoil where it finds the chrysalis of army moths and it lays an, um, lays an egg inside that chrysalis. As that wasp egg hatches, it eats what's inside the chrysalis. And de destroying the, the grub of that army moth. So it's quite useful for um, pest control. We have a various species of army moth in New Zealand and they, they can all be, um, some are native, some are introduced and they can be, um, they are crop pests. This one up, down in the bottom right, this is Natalia producta, also known as the red jacket or red soldier wasp. It has this beautiful orange body. Again, she lay, likes to lay her eggs in army worm caterpillars. So not so much in the pupa, but in the caterpillar. And as those eggs hatch from within the caterpillar, it consumes the caterpillar from the inside out. So you know, another useful um, wasp species for pest control, particularly of army moths. Now, the re reason I focused on these two is we actually have a new species of army, wor army moth that recently um, came to New Zealand. It was introduced about a year ago. It's called the fall, fall army worm. And it, outside its home range, it, it's, it's a huge pest worldwide. It feeds on over 350 sort of plant species, but it particularly likes maize and corn. Um, it also likes potatoes, tomatoes, capsicum, aubergines, and, and brassicas like cabbages. So it's a, it's a massive pest. It's only just starting to distribute in New Zealand. We're not sure of what effect it will have. But my my the question I have is given that these two species of wasps do um, parasitize other army worm moths, whether or not they will come to our assistance. Okay, so um that's really all I wanted to share with you um, in terms of what I've learned and come to understand um, about wasps um, today. This is a list of uh, references and further reading. I really relied heavily on the iNaturalist website. Um, if you've joined the call today, I will send you a, a, an email containing my slides. And also, um, if you've posted any questions, I will provide answers to those questions as well. In fact, yeah, okay, so um, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.